where does the power of noncompliance rest? Um, so for me, which is all I can speak to, um, I grew up an abuse, with an abusive dad, and I was a little kid, but I always still push back against him constantly. And so I always know that in the worst of circumstances when I felt the most powerless, that just finding that little place in my gut where I thought I'm, I'm worth more than this and I have a power is sort of the root of all of it. So if I could stand up t to you know, a grown man when I was a little kid, then I can stand up to anything. So, and that means I've stood up to cops before to my own detriment. But yeah, that's really where the power of it rests for me, the seed of it, I guess. And I can always kind of go back and find that feeling and say, even if this is difficult for you, even if you might lose out or people might look at you weird for doing it, you have more power now than you did then. And you can keep finding your power um, and keep pushing. So that's really at the core of it. I got beat up by a cop once. I couldn't do anything. I couldn't defend myself. Defending myself was a crime. I just felt so fucking powerless. From there on, it was, I have to find ways to take power back, to push against authority, just however to do it, to just eke out whatever little bits of agency I have. Those are mine, and I'm goddamn not letting them take it away from me. I've been in that situation, and I stood up to power in whatever little way I had to do it. In defying and non-complying, we bend the world to our own will instead of bending ourselves to the world. The thing that Marx didn't really get was gender and how gender roles and family roles set who we are and set us up for systems of obedience. Especially like the nuclear family, you know, dad is the king, the mother takes care of the children and the children are possessions. That's kind of where I started to realize like that the typical familial structure was based on authoritarianism. So I had already seen like the, the literal violent methods of the male authoritarian system in the family. So that set me up for some anti-authority. Well, I'm always hesitant to tell anyone else how they should live. But I think, you know, when you go back to the whole idea of, of progress being made by unreasonable people, you know, we're told a lot of things, how our life should be. We see examples of it with our family, sometimes good, sometimes bad. I think if we never stop and think to look outside of the boundaries we've been told we have to stay in, we're never gonna find out who we really are. Um, we're just gonna be this figment of somebody else's imagination and somebody else's idea of what our lives are supposed to be. We have to be non-compliant like in times like now when we're facing you know, uh, encroaching fascism uh, from many, many angles. If we are compliant, that's how you get tyranny. So on some level, especially a political one, there's times when you absolutely have to be. How have you gone about creating an identity based on your own terms, a way from what we get that to believe our standard values, ideas, and concepts of identity. I don't know that there's that there's any strategy or any real creation to it. I think that's a thing of you just sort of live your way into it. Like whatever sense of who you are, you know, the more sure of yourself you become in it and the more you live in the world and have to jump over whatever obstacles the world gives you, you learn as you go. It's just like that, the cop thing, who am I? Okay, this is who I thought I was. Here is who I am after that. What have I learned from this? You know, how do I keep resisting, but also still live a life? You know, I think a lot of people get this impression of, of people as being like, arg, 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 angry feminists. And it's like, sure, I'm angry. I'm damned angry, but I'm also like, I wanna live a happy life. You know, I wanna live a life filled with 
people and, and cats and great music and I want to have joy, but here's this other thing that's completely fucking up my joy and everybody else's. So you just kind of find your spaces where the need for resistance is and you respond to them as you live and hope that it has an impact and hope that you're doing the right thing and just try and be the best you can at it. As you grow older, as you experience more of these things, you, you take them in stride and you learn how to deal with them. Lisa, why did you become a DJ? Oh, um, well, I like techno and I, I like to be participating in all things that I like. Um, also, uh, I kind of suck at being compliant <laughs> at jobs. I've had like, what was it, 35 jobs? 30, 36? I don't know. I counted 10 years ago. It was like 35 jobs. I suck at authority. So I've worked jobs. I can work a job, but I just wanted to be creative my entire life. I wanted to travel and make music. So I used to want to be a, a, a you know, punk guitarist and then a synthesizer player. And then I heard techno, so it was DJing. And, you know, I'll probably still have to have a job, <laughs> but uh, I'm gonna try really hard not to. <laughs> Can you list the jobs? Oh God, what? telemarketing, I've set appointments for windows and siding. I've set appointments for vacuum cleaners, air filtration systems, all kinds of appointment setting for sales. I've done fundraising for you know, all sorts of nonprofits. That was my last job, and then I ended up as an IT manager. I've worked fast food, slipped coffee, got fired once for punching out a manager who was harassing me. Oh, I worked in a, a warehouse breaking down packing crates. Yeah, lots of just random jobs, just terrible minimum wage jobs. So, what do you think you'll do after DJing? Um, I'm gonna be a librarian. Why do I think we're programmed to comply with the dominant notions like patriarchy and identity? Because it's a control mechanism. It makes us great little worker bees or it makes women great little subservient sex slaves and reproductive devices. It just sort of fits into the notions of white supremacist patriarchal control, <laughs> essentially. I mean, look, you've got religious structures that scare people into thinking that if you're a woman and you don't get married and maybe like women sexually or whatever, that you are literally going to burn in eternal hellfire. And I've known people who were truly convinced that that was true. It dictated so much of their life that they lived completely not according to who they were. Yeah, it's a control mechanism. Like, you keep people in line. People who don't care about that stuff are dangerous. Lisa, um, what does uh, non-compliance mean to you? Um, non-compliance to me is knowing that, you know, we live in a society where there are certain expectations and strictures to how we live, how we behave, who we love, what color we are, how much money we have, all of that, um, and realizing that, you know, I didn't make those rules, so, you know, th those rules don't have to define any of us. Okay. Um, so just say the title and okay. um, what it is, I guess. Actually. All right, so Berghain once asked me to write a thing for their flyers. I think they expected a little political screed, and what they got was this little film slash made up fan fiction called Berghainia. Berghainia? I'm really bad at that pronunciation. 
I haven't seen a rave planet in years. Alexandra shook her head as she scanned the view screen. Her co-pilot grimaced, not since the burning plastic man planet. I don't think I'll ever get all the dust out of my enough. I've heard plenty about what dust is trapped in what crevice. She turned back to the screen with a shiver. This culture is advanced. No way they're broadcasting without a long range jamming signal. Why take the chance, Refusian wondered. It's like they don't know the ascetics are monitoring the galaxy or they don't care. She shrugged. I don't know if they're stupid or bold, but as much as I hate inserting us between planetary outliers and the ascetics, someone should tell them it's a bad idea to make themselves a target. The ascetic empire, a religious earth cult with a mantra of disciplined deprivation in service of their squid god, had declared their rules universal. And Squid God was very particular about rules, especially those pertaining to music with repetitive beats and anything to do with the 47 feminine genders in the spectrum. So she stayed out of sight in the outer bands, doing odd jobs for credits, and now she was going to get them into a mess to warn this planet not to draw so much attention. Not their typical mess, at least. This one had a good soundtrack. She bobbed her head to the beat. Never could resist a 909 snare, she sighed. Let's see if we can get in and get back out without a problem. Refusian muttered to himself, when's the last time that happened? I heard that. So, yeah. You made it. <laughs> uh, I've had to jam poetry into three minutes, so I'm pretty good at that part. <laughs>